Okay, so we're live and Well, here we are. We are live. Welcome to God Save the King. My name is Tim Kyes. I am the host of God Save the King. And uh, this gentleman over here, this is Michael Parker, my my guest or my guest host or my co-host or whatever you want to call him. We we have him back. I flew solo last week. So great to have you here again, Michael. Thank you for asking me. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun today. We're going to talk about some fun stuff. Let's take care of a little bit of business right away. Let's get our, our disclaimers out of the way that we have to mention, which is the fact that the views of God Save the King, okay, so whether that's me or Michael or any other guest I may have on here, are not necessarily the views of the Truth Be Told Radio Network, so we take responsibility for that. And then also we want to make sure that you are aware that you can listen to God Save the King uh, on the Truth Be Told Radio Network Fridays at 10 p.m. Eastern. And you can listen on their website. Go to truthbetoldnetwork.org.org and click on the big listen button. But you can also listen on your Alexa or Google Home devices, your Apple iPhone. Plus, there are phone numbers where you can call in my tuner, Wi-Fi radio, and things like that. So lots of different ways to listen to the Truth Be Told radio network. And of course, you know, this is God Save the King. Please feel free to go to our website, godsavetheking.org. Uh, make sure you enter in your name and, you know, become a member so that you can get updates on what we're doing. So there you go. There you have it. And welcome to God Save the King. And today is actually the second day of the Hebrew feast of Rosh Hashanah. And Michael and I were talking about this uh, off camera. And so what we want to do today is this is actually a little bit of a special special episode because I want to take advantage of the fact that we are on the Feast of Rosh Hashanah because this is a key component of God Save the King, is what day Jesus was actually born. And we believe that Jesus was actually born on the Feast of Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year. And, you know, I'm assuming, Michael, let me ask you a question. This, we're going to, you know, change roles here for a sec. Please, let's do it. So when we when we began our work together several years ago, this was news to you, wasn't it? Absolutely. I, I I'm, listen. I'm I'm not Jewish, and so um, I'm embarrassed to say that I was not familiar with a lot of this, and uh, so I'm learning, and it's it's super interesting. Yeah. Well, what's important here is that this is the, you know, uh, one of the points that we emphasize a lot in God Save the King is the fact that the nativity, okay it's not really a Christian story. Now I'm splitting hairs, you know, I'm definitely splitting hairs, but we assume because of Christmas, right. And the erroneous belief that Jesus was born on December 25th, that therefore, you know, the nativity is this, it's the start of the Christian story, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the cross hadn't occurred yet. That was still 30 some years off, you know, but that this is somehow Jesus was a Christian already and that, you know, maybe even Mary and Joseph were Christians somehow. Not really sure how that works out, but it's it's kind of funny how we tend to look backwards through 2000 years of tradition and then we superimpose certain ideas on the, the nativity that just simply wouldn't have been there. Right. And so one of the fundamental premises that I like to point out very, very frequently, you know, is the fact that, you know, we um, you know, this is a this is a Jewish story. Jesus, Mary and Joseph were Jewish. I mean, just unquestionably, they were Jewish. Everything they would have done would have reflected that fact. And it's the Jewishness of the story is actually what gives it. It's um, what's the word I want to use? It's relevance, 
you know, it's not really relevant unless it is a Jewish story. So here, you know, part of our, and we're going to talk about this in detail. We're going to unpack why, okay, we're going to unpack why I believe Jesus of Nazareth was born on Rosh Hashanah, also known as Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, on why I believe that's the case. But this is why this is significant, is that he was born on a Jewish feast day. It's it's interesting because since I've been knowing you and you've taught me all of this, I was on Facebook a day or two ago and I started seeing all of the shofars and, and the trumpets and the horns and everything. And I was like, I get it now. I understand. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, the simple truth of the matter for um, you know our listeners who are not familiar with this, and like I said, we're going to unpack it here in a minute. We're going to take some time and really go into detail. But for our listeners that are not familiar with this, I believe that Jesus of Nazareth was born between about 6.30 and 8 p.m. On the Gregorian calendar, it would, be, it would have been September 11th, 3 B.C., but on the Jewish calendar, that would have been on the Feast of Rosh Hashanah, okay? Or, like I said, or it's also called Yom Teruah, which means the Day of Trumpets, which means as Jesus was being born in Bethlehem, approximately six miles away in the temple in Jerusalem, the priests would have been blowing shofars announcing, you know, the, the sighting of the new moon, right? And therefore the new year, the, the new month and the new year. And then, you know, they would have been frankly, you know, blasting shofars celebrating the birth of, birth of their king without even fully realizing, you know? And incredible. Michael, go ahead. What were you going to say? Well, it, go, it, here again, I did not know the importance of the new moon. I, I enjoy um, astronomy, and I didn't understand until today, prep, prepping for this show, I was reading about some people checking in on various forums saying, hey, uh, we have people in Israel who have now sighted the new moon, and you and I discussed that a little bit. Maybe you can explain that to some of the folks who are like me, and this is this is new to us. Sure, absolutely. So the key, one of the keys here, one of the pieces of the puzzle is that the Jewish religious calendar is a lunar calendar. It is determined by the cycles of the moon. Okay, most modern calendars, especially and some ancient calendars were solar calendars. The Jewish religious calendar is a lunar calendar based on the sighting of the moon. And even, even though, even in ancient culture, you know, they knew math, they could count the number of days. It wasn't really, you know, rocket science to go, oh yeah, every 29.25 days, there's a new moon. You know what day the new moon is going to be. Nonetheless, part of the religious observation combined with the celestial observation was that people had to literally see the new moon with their eyes and then report it to the Sanhedrin, the ruling council, and then the Sanhedrin would declare it is so, right? Because they had a new moon festival every month, but this one's a little more important because this is the new moon festival that determines the civil new year. It is New Year's Day. So mm -hmm. for, therefore, this was a big deal that you had to have these witnesses. And by the way, it was two witnesses. OK, so and each of them had to independently cite the new moon, report it to the Sanhedrin. And then the Sanhedrin would declare, pardon me, it is so. And then they would blow the trumpets, the shofars. Um, announcing that New Year's Day is official. And, and if you go, if you go onto some of these sites, um, if you want to just look up the lunar calendar for the U.S. or Farmer's Almanac or whatever, you will find that in this particular month, the new moon actually begins on what we, you know, September six for us. Correct. But but it takes twenty four or thirty six hours for you to actually be able to get to see that sliver of what we think of as the new. Correct. Movie. See, and that brings up another very important point, which is that in Jewish reckoning, the day begins at sunset. Mm -hmm. Okay. In our, in our modern understanding, we start the day at 12 midnight, right? Yes. But they started it approximately six hours earlier. Okay. At sunset. So what, so this is what's critical to what we're going to discuss today is that as the sun is going down, and that sliver of the new moon is becoming visible, 
right? Those two things are required. We're going to talk about what's called naked eye observation, N-E-O, okay? So you actually had to be able to see this with your eyes. It wasn't simply a matter of calculating it, you know, with an instrument of some type. You actually had to be able to see it, right? So as the sun goes down and as the sliver of the new moon becomes visible at sunset, see? So that's the beginning of the day in their reckoning. So even though we would have called sunset, on Monday, right, mm -hmm. we would have called that September 6th, okay, they would actually call it, you, you, it that's actually the beginning of, quote unquote, Tuesday to them. You track right. with me? Because yes. in our modern understanding, that's 6 p.m. Monday, but in Jewish reckoning, that's the beginning of the day of the next day that night comes first. Yes. And by yes. the way, that comes from Genesis, you know, during the creation in Genesis chapter one, it says God created the evening and the morning. And that was the first day, not the morning and the evening, the evening and the morning, the evening comes first. And so Tishri is the first day, the seventh month of the ecclesiastical year. Correct. Yep. Which, okay. So explain that. Unpack that a little bit for okay. me. What so, the meaning so is there? You've got, so you've got a lunar calendar that, by the way, typically has 12 months. It doesn't always have 12 months because of the fact that the lunar and the solar cycles don't always add up. Okay. Right. They have to have a, so it's, it's why we have leap years in our, in our modern calendar, right? Is because lunar and solar calendars there, they don't sync right they they don't sync up they they're they're different right so this has been true since people have been measuring time and marking calendars that the lunar and the and the solar calendars don't line up so typically a jewish year has 12 months but they actually have a leap month that they add i think it's once every i forget off the top of my head once every 17 years or something like that they add this whole additional month that gets it all to click right so in the Jewish religious calendar, however, there are two New Year's days. There's the beginning of the religious year. Okay. So actually, I have to correct you. You actually said it incorrectly. This is the this is the, the new this is the New Year's Day for the civil year, not right. the ecclesiastical yes. year. You're right. You're right. The, You're right. The, the ecclesiastical year actually begins in the spring with Passover. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the civil new year. So, uh, so this is both the first month and the seventh month. Okay. At the same time. Right. And when it comes to the required festivals that the Jews were required to keep that that's what makes this significant is this does become the seventh month because seven is a significant number in Jewish understanding, because that's the, the Hebrew word Shabbat, you know, for the mm -hmm. Sabbath. Is, is simply the word seven. That's that's all it means. So they had different types of Sabbaths. They had a Sabbath of days. So in other words, a, a Sabbath every week. But they also had sabbatical years. Okay. And then, of course, they have also had sabbatical months. So this would be, you know, a special holy day, a special Sabbath during the seventh month, during the sabbatical month in the ecclesiastical year and then the first month in the civil year. So yeah. And help, help me remember, mm -hmm. would Mary and Joseph's trip have been uh, significantly inspired by these festivals? Well, yes, of course it would have been. Now see for years, yeah. for years um, we presumed, I presumed I, I made an error that is, somewhat understandable, right? Because we are so heavily influenced by the traditional nativity story. Mm -hmm. And in the traditional nativity story, Mary and Joseph pull into Bethlehem and then she delivers the same night mm -hmm. that they pull into Bethlehem. And that's, I'm sorry, but now that's just, it's just ridiculous to assume that, right? For pregnancy reasons alone, we, right. it's, it's ridiculous to assume that she was traveling while in labor, regardless of what method they were using, whether she rode on a donkey, whether she walked, whether she rode in the back of a cart, it's a little bit ridiculous to think that she was traveling and in labor, right? 
Mm -hmm. And then we'll unpack this more in a different episode, but for secrecy reasons, see, I believe that when Mary realized that she truly was pregnant, right. And not just the annunciation, which was a big enough deal on its own, but when she actually physically could recognize that she was pregnant, that she immediately decided that she had to keep it a secret mm -hmm. that she could not tell anyone absolutely anyone and that this also including the necessity of leaving nazareth she was not going to remain in nazareth so we know she bugged out and went to visit elizabeth initially to get away for a while and then she came back and i believe that's when the nuptials occurred between her and joseph but that then they also the two of them once joseph knew that the two of them immediately assumed that um they had to leave Nazareth together. They had to get out of there, right? So I actually think they traveled much, much earlier in the year uh, than, than we now assume. But to go back to your question was for a long time, we assumed, I assumed that they had to travel in conjunction with the fall feasts. Right. That right. since they would have, since Joseph was going to have to be in near Jerusalem anyway, for the fall feasts that they traveled in conjunction. Whereas now I believe they traveled frankly for a completely separate reason, which is that the, um, the registration by Augustus Caesar providentially popped up on their calendar and that they had to leave Nazareth and go to Bethlehem in order to register. And then that got them out of town. And then scripture very plainly tells us that while they were there, Right. They had been they had been in Bethlehem for several months, actually, that while they were there, you know, the day came that she she should be delivered. And oh, lo and behold, it dropped right on Rosh Hashanah, the civil new year. Fascinating. Um, so, well, let's let's go back to the Rosh Hashanah and this particular point in time, because when I look at your work, you have this you have a pretty good list of benchmarks that you're using to triangulate. Mm -hmm these dates sure and now might be an appropriate time to yeah to no, we'll, no we'll burn through these very quickly because right. we'll actually we'll actually do these in another episode we'll take okay. the time to unpack these in detail you know in in a different episode so today we'll just kind of burn through them a little bit because ironically what are known as the infancy narratives okay so the infancy narratives is Matthew chapters one and two, and then Luke chapters one and two. Those are the only sections of the Bible that deal with na the nativity. And I noticed that almost all of these benchmarks are those two books. Exactly. Right. So yeah. both um, records, both narratives and Luke in particular, ironically, these contain more chronological information than virtually any other record in the Bible which is really ironic because, you know, we talk about this a lot that the Bible does not explicitly mention when Jesus was born, right? That's a common misconception. I'm sure that there are quite literally millions of Christians around the globe that assume that the Bible tells us when Jesus was born. And it doesn't, right? at least not explicitly, or right. even implicitly, it doesn't tell us when Jesus was born. I believe it tells us cryptically, which is exactly what we're going to talk about today. We're going to get there in a little while. But what's really interesting here is that in these two records of Matthew and especially Luke, there is a ton of chronological information. So what you want to do, the way historical research works, is you want to start with the broadest of these parameters and then work your way down. Just keep keep working your way down like this. And by and by see by taking one let's see, let me get my fingers on camera here. So mm -hmm. if you have one span of time that's like this, and then another span of time like this, and then you can cross them over against each other, they overlap. Well, then that overlap is when something must have happened, right? Mm -hmm. So like I said, we'll unpack these in detail in a different episode. But so the first and broadest one, of course, is that we are told that Jesus is born during the reign of the Roman emperor Augustus Caesar. OK, now he reigned from 27 B.C. to 14 A.D. Now, that's a pretty big time frame. But yes. there we go. We now know he was born in a 40 year 
time period. Mm -hmm. Okay, there you go. There's number one. Like I said, you start with the broadest and then you narrow it down, right? So then if we take the second one, which is we know he was born during the reign of the Roman appointed king of Judea, Herod the Great. Okay, now Herod ruled from 37 BC until 1 BC. Now we got to go on a little bit of a bunny trail real quick here. We'll do it quickly and we'll come right back, which is that the traditionally, I believe that the traditionally accepted date of Herod's death is incorrect. So if you go to Wikipedia or you go to Encyclopedia Britannica or something like that, they're going to tell you that Herod died in 4 BC. I believe that is incorrect. I believe he died in 1 BC and that that is critical to accurately dating when Jesus was born because if you think he was born in 4 BC, then you've got to look for, or pardon me, if you think Herod died in 4 BC, yeah. then you're limiting your investigation to before that time. Mm -hmm. And by limiting your investigation to that time frame, you're actually missing possibilities, right? By correcting it to 1 BC, now you can examine a few additional years that you might not have been examining otherwise. And you and go figure, you discover that the evidence points you there anyway. So like I said, we'll, we'll really dive into that on another time. But uh, Herod the Great ruled Judea as a Roman appointee from 37 BC to 1 BC. So now if we take mm -hmm. just simply those two parameters and overlap them, now we've narrowed it from 40 years to 26 years, okay? Yeah. Sometime between 27 BC and 1 BC, okay? Mm -hmm. So now if we move to the next parameter, so the next parameter is the, the what we call the governorship of Quirinius, okay? Now, people who are familiar with the nativity story are familiar with this name because of the nativity story. If it weren't for the nativity story, we probably wouldn't pay any attention to this guy because we are told that he was the Roman governor of Syria, right? Now, the interesting thing is, is that this was actually a very notable Roman official. Quirinius was, he had a lot of very notable assignments in the Near East in this general time frame. And one of them, I'm giving the abbreviated version. Once again, we'll unpack it in detail another time. But one of those assignments was he was the Roman governor of Syria, okay, of the Roman province of Syria. But he was governor of the Roman province of Syria in like 6 AD. Now, that doesn't make sense because that's way too late. That's way too late, right? Right. So this has been a real problem in establishing the timeline. And frankly, you know, uh, Luke, as the as a historian, has taken a lot of flack uh, from other historians saying, well, this can't possibly be right because you don't you don't have your you know, we know Quirinius was governor of Syria in 6 AD. So it's all it's all screwed up. Right. Well, the short version is, is that when you read scripture carefully, you discover that he had other assignments. Right in the region at that time, and that therefore he was a governor in Syria, not the governor of Syria, and that he what he did hold official posts at the time that we believe Jesus was born. So he was a man of high office that exactly was he was a man of high office and he had um offices that he held in the Near East in the early BC or the, the late BCs, you know, so like between one and six BC. Okay. So let's, let's move on very quickly because we want to get through this and get to yep. the astronomy. That's what we really want to yep. talk about. And so then the next one is you've got Herod himself. When the Magi show up, he asks them, what time did the star appear? Okay. And then because he's going to eliminate this threat to his throne he reduces the time frame to two years. So that's an enormous hint right there. I mean, you could you could skip everything I said up until now and just go to that one and say, okay, well, Herod is still alive, right? And he died in 1 BC. And if he's going to kill all the male children up to two years old, well, then that means Jesus was born sometime between 1 and 3 BC. I mean, so you yeah. can you can clear out a lot of argument really fast right there. But then you also have um, 
uh, Caesar's registration and oath of office because we read about the decree that was issued by Augustus Caesar, that there went out a decree that all the world should be registered, right? And although we don't have like an absolute specific date for when that happened, our best guess for that is that that decree went out in the summer of 3 BC. Okay, so now we're starting to really narrow it down. Uh, Herod's margin for error between 1 and 3 BC, best guess on Caesar's registration is 3 BC. And then the final one is that we are told that um, Jesus began his public ministry at 30 years of age in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, if you simply do the math, take the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar and then back up 30 years, it lands you in 3 BC. Okay, so so Bravo. now we've we've got three indicators, one, two, three, that all put it pretty much in three BC. Now we might be off by a year, right? But it's really it's pretty obvious now that he was born in three BC. And then the final one, which is what we're going to spend our time on for the rest of the show, is that there is the cryptic sign that is given in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, and then corroborated by Genesis 49, 10, that is a sign in the heavens. It's a celestial sign. And once you plug this into like an astronomy program in a computer, you discover that this specific sign would have been, a vis would have been visible on the Western horizon between about 6.30 and 8 p.m. on September 11th, 3 BC, which, oh yeah, just happened to be the first day of Tishri, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah, the year that Jesus was born. I still have a hard time appreciating all of this. It is just, it, it's a massive um, <laughs> acknowledgement of something that most people don't know about. And yeah. um, if you could, if you could read those two um, proverbs for for us, just sure, so sure, people absolutely. Know which one so you're talking let's, about. Let's, yeah, let's talk about that here. Let me pull them up on my. Uh, my little notes here and I'll, I'll read off the description. So it's, it's two verses. It's revelation 12, one, and then Genesis 49, 10. And both of these, you can see rather quickly, you can start going, yeah, that's what, what's he describing? What's going, what's going on here? So the first one is, you know, the apostle John, and it says that he was in the spirit on the law, the Lord's day. And he saw this vision. And in this vision, it says, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. Okay. Now, like I said, I believe that is a celestial sign and we'll yeah. unpack that here in just a second. Okay. Now, ironically, however, I also believe that Genesis 49, 10 is also in view. Now, Genesis 49, 10 is uh, Jacob, the patriarch Jacob prophesying over his 12 sons and as he prophesies over Judah, his son Judah, he says, the, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, I believe that is also a, he's seeing something in the heavens that is being described there. And it's when you take these two signs, because here you go, right? How did we begin the whole show? We began the whole show talking about the two witnesses. Yes. Okay. Because in Deuteronomy, under the law of the Jews, under the law of Moses, we are told that by the mouth of two or three witnesses shall the matter be established. Okay. So that was a matter of law. If you had a court case, right, you had to have at least two witnesses that corroborated the same evidence, right? So we have to have two witnesses that corroborate the sighting of the new moon, right? You have, to, and these are the, these are also, by the way, this is a not so veiled reference to the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. Same thing, okay? So mm -hmm. for all of the eschatology and end times people out there trying to figure out what comes next, this is, this is the two witnesses. This is the concept of the two witnesses. So now when it comes to the birth of Jesus Christ as being understood from the signs in the heavens, we have two witnesses, one from the Old Testament and one from the New, and they fit together 
just like this. They piece together absolutely perfectly. So like I said, number one, Revelation 12, 1, uh, the woman clothed the sun, the moon underneath her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And then uh, Genesis 49, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. And that when you put the two pieces together, you get a very specific, that's the key, you get a very specific sign uh, that was visible in the heavens. And then all you got to do is plug that into an astronomy program and you get the date Jesus was born. I don't know if we have the ability to do this. Do you do you have a photo of or a depiction? I actually do. Share? I actually I actually got Great. this ready. So let me make sure I can do it. And maybe this you can here. kind of walk it through walk us through it and explain what we're looking sure. at. And mm -hmm. and I'm guessing that one of these bodies is going to be Venus. Um, I'm pretty sure that is because the, the only reason I said that is on September 9th, in two days, it's going to be a conjunction or whatever you want to call it, of mm -hmm. the moon and Venus. And and I'm just right. assuming that it would have been okay. the same then. Sure. Now, let when me I say get, conjunction, uh, I just mean the way it looks. Okay. So we're get, so here we go. So now, now go. so people who are watching this, um, you know, on computer right now, or something with a big enough screen can see this. Now, I need to make a disclaimer. Okay. I have made this picture using a black background. Okay. But this thing right here, that's the sun, right? Can you see, can you see, oh, let's see if I can get to, can there we you go. see my cursor? Yes. Okay. So if you can see my cursor, that's the sun. Right. So, right. So this is the woman clothed with the sun. This is the constellation Virgo, right? And this is a woman clothed with the sun. The sun's right smack in the middle of her body. Now, here's the thing. The reason this is on a black background is to help us understand what we are seeing, but if you were actually outside and the sun was this far above the horizon, you wouldn't be able to see any of this, right? Because the sun would obscure the stars. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to see it. It's only when the sun starts to dip below the horizon that you would actually be able to see this. Okay. So now what I'm going to do, bear with me a second here is I'm going to switch this out to a different, uh, graphic so that we're going to be able to um, see more of what I'm ta talking about here. I got to go to a different graphic here. Boom, 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 boom. We go bang, bang. Tim, okay. Tim yeah. just, look, just so I understand. So when the sun is, is going down and we're, so this would be dusk and, and the short Correct. time after dusk that we would be able to see all of this. Correct. Exactly. Right. Okay. Yep. So now here's a different representation, right? Because this is the same sign a few hours later when the sun has dipped below the horizon. Okay. Yes. And this is critical because a lot of, a lot of critics of this theory say, oh, well, you had to be able to see the whole thing. And it's like, no, 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 you didn't. You didn't have to be able to see the whole thing because this is how ancient celestial observation worked. Okay. This, and this is, I think is a piece of the puzzle that a lot of people miss is that the tomb is that ancient astronomers would have people watching all night long. They would work in shifts. Okay. They would work in shifts and they would watch the skies all night long, but the two critical observations were the morning observation and the evening observation, which would have coincided with sunrise and sunset, okay? So at sunrise, they would have been observing from, you know, like at least an hour before sunset, and they would have been watching the stars and then cataloging, okay, this star's in this position, the star's in this position, we, you know, et cetera, et cetera, until the, then the sun starts to peak above the horizon, and when the sun gets far enough above the horizon, now you can't see the stars anymore, right? Yes. And then, of course, the reverse is what happens in the evening. Now, this is what we're seeing in the evening is on screen right now, right? Mm -hmm. Is that now the sun goes down, and because the sun goes down, now the stars start to be able to appear. So you would have required a trained observer, and here's why. Because the trained observer would have had to have known the outline of the asterism by memory, okay? Because he was only going to be able to see part of it because part of it would have been obscured by the sun until the sun either 
went down or before the sun came up, just depending upon whether it's the morning or the evening observation, right? So the point here is that um, uh, that uh, he is um, this this would have been the evening observation, right? They yeah. would have been watching while the sun was setting, okay, and that now the sun has gone down, right? And you can see half of the constellation of Virgo. You can't see the whole thing, but if you're a trained observer, you know what you're seeing. That's the point, is you know what you're seeing. Tim, question. Yeah. So you're saying that critics um, fault this for what you explained, but to me that's a little strange because what you just outlined is quite reasonable that an astute follower of the stars who did this day in and day out and people had been doing this for hundreds of thousands of years because that was the television of the day, what was above you. Precisely. So, so to me, it's not a jump to think that, well, yeah, they, they knew what the entire constellation or pattern of stars looked like. So just because they couldn't see it entirely above the horizon, the people who were trained in this would obviously Correct. know what the entire looked like. I, I don't understand why that's well hard it's, to it's, grasp. Or it's, be it's because there's a lot of amateurs – in this field, okay, that are in, trying to figure out whether this is true or not and, and looking at the sign. So you get some people who jump to conclusions and say, well, you know, you would have had to be able to see the whole thing in the sky at one time or it wouldn't count. And it's like, no, <laughs> right? And, and right. part of the reason we know that is because the sun being in a particular sign, you know, that's how horoscopes work, right? Right. Yeah. Right. So whether you're talking about your birthday, my birthday or Jesus of Nazareth's birthday, you have to know that the sun is in that sign. Well, if the sun is above the horizon, you can't see the sign. Mm -hmm. So how do you know the sun is in the sign unless you're able to see it when the sun is below the horizon? And you're only seeing part of the sign. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. It, 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 yeah. it has to be. Otherwise, all astronomy falls apart. Right. Right. Yeah. Horoscopes fall completely apart yeah. if that's if that's a per, if that's a prerequisite, right? And of course, we're not going to take that rabbit trail right no. now. But I am also talking about um, what's the word I want to use? You know, secular <laughs> um, astrology, not yes. biblical astronomy. That's right. a rabbit trail we don't want to go down right now. So okay. now let me. So this is see now. So this is the woman clothed with the sun. Now let me get back over here so you can hopefully see my cursor. Because you've got the whole sign here, right? The woman, the sun is below her body. But if you were doing the evening observation, right, you would have known that the sun was in the middle of her body. That's a woman called the sun, right? And mm -hmm. then over here, very hard to see, is the brand new sliver of the new moon, right? Yes. So, yes. and look at where it is. It is under her feet. So that right there tells us, all kinds of things because see the woman clothed at the sun that alone that all by itself actually occurs every year right mm -hmm. but you don't get the woman clothed at the sun and the moon under her feet every year right because right. the moon might not be over here it might be someplace else yes. while the sun is in virgo okay and then what you especially don't get every year is that you don't always get the on her cred on her head a crown of 12 stars okay mm -hmm. so let me switch out the graphic and let's go uh see if i can get that one in the in the picture here all right one sec here so that would be this and this and we go boom boom click 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 okay so now this is the crown of 12 stars okay? we're not seeing anything oh, um or we're there not we seeing anything yet Boom. There we go. Yep. Okay. So now this is the crown of 12 stars. And this is what I mean by you. This would be the morning observation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now it's hard to see in this picture and it'll be hard to see on your computer screen. But right down here, if you can see my cursor is the very beginning of the sun beginning to rise. Yes. Okay. So if you're out observing an hour before sunrise, this is what you see. Okay. Now, this is the constellation Leo. Yes. Okay. Now, Leo, see, each of the 12 major constellations 
is connected to one of the 12 tribes of Judah. The constellation Leo is connected to the tribe of Judah. Okay. We are Makes told in, we are told in Revelation that as a matter of fact that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is absolutely a reference to this sign right here. Okay. And this is and see, and this is Genesis 49:10. This is the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, right? But to give people who are watching here an idea of how this works, this is Leo, okay? This is the crown of 12 stars, but this right here, which I haven't put on the screen, would be where I'm, oh, here, hang on, where I'm circling my cursor right now, this would be the head of Virgo. So the crown is right above her head, where yes. is where, which is where a crown should be. But the point being is that it would require this observation in the morning and then the woman clothed at the sun in the evening, yes. and it would require a trained observer to put it together in his head in order to figure this out. Okay? But they would be able to do that because they've been studying this for years and years, and they've exactly, seen these cycles they occur. Would see, they would see part of the sign in the evening, they'd see part of the sign in the morning. And because that was how it was done, right? That was how it was done. They would be able to go, Oh my God, this is, this is amazing. This is the, this is now, now John didn't write revelation until the nineties AD. So we don't know for certain whether any celestial observers actually saw this sign some something i am still working on okay is exactly what it was the magi saw right now maybe they saw this it's entirely possible that they did because what i believe the magi saw was a um what's the what's the word i want to use they it saw a, two bodies very close together right Right. Well, what the what the Magi saw, which again we'll do in another episode, right? Because it's just way too much for a single hour. The Magi saw a series of celestial events. They didn't see a singular celestial event. They saw a series of celestial events involving primarily the planet Jupiter. Right. Okay. Because the planet Jupiter in biblical astronomy is referred to as the king star. And I'm going to explain more about that in just yeah. in one second here, right? But they saw a series of events, and this may have been one of them, okay? This may have been one of them. Um, but, they saw, but like I said, they saw a series. That's the thing. They saw a series of events. And whether they saw this one or not, we don't know hyper-specifically, but we kind of have to assume they did, even though John wrote about this one almost 100 years later. This is for our benefit. Well, if I might add, it, in this in this picture, the, the fonts are very small, but mm -hmm. at the bottom, you have Mercury. We had Venus, as we discussed right. earlier, might be in here. And then if you go up here to the front paws of Leo the lion, you will see that Jupiter is right there between those four Four legs. Four paws, right. Which yeah. is, by the way, that is exactly why this is this is a reference to um, uh, Genesis 49.10, right? Is this little grouping right here is the planet Jupiter in conjunction with the star Regulus. Yes. Okay? Now, this is significant for a couple of reasons. Because, number one, this is Leo the Lion which is the tribe of Judah and Judah is the royal tribe. That's what it, there's, there's, there's like about four layers of meaning to Genesis 49, 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Okay. Well, one of the things that means is that the scepter belongs to Judah. Well, what is the scepter if not the right to rule? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the scepter belongs to Judah. Okay. Well, that means Judah is the royal tribe. OK, and all the kings, OK, with the exception of the very first king, Saul, all the kings of Israel came from the tribe of Judah. Right. So this is Leo the lion. It is connected to the tribe of Judah. It is the royal tribe and the royal sign, which is why it is a crown. OK. And then 
it's in conjunction with the star Regulus. Now, this is great because the Hebrew word regel is the Hebrew word for feet. So, so in Genesis 49.10, when it says that the lawgiver shall not depart from between his feet, that's a direct reference to this star. It's Stop Hebrew, it already. My goodness. Right? <laughs> to, to, it's the Hebrew word regel, okay? Yeah. Because according to the book of Psalms, the king rules wherever he puts his feet. Mm -hmm. Okay? Heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. Wherever the king puts his feet, right? So what you have here is you've got a picture of the scepter being in Judah and not departing from between his feet until Shiloh comes, until Jesus was born. Because see, this is Jesus's birth sky, right? This is the sign that was in the heaven on the day he was born, see? And what's really, we're not going to do it, okay? And boy, am I going to ruffle people's feathers by saying this. Go but ahead. now you can understand, see, you can't have a counterfeit without a genuine. Counterfeits cannot exist if there is not a genuine. If there is no genuine, then counterfeits become meaningless, okay? So what are you alluding to? What I am driving at is that this is biblical astronomy. Horoscopes and all that other garbage only exist because this exists. Right. Okay? This is biblical judeo archaeo astronomy that we can see from the Bible and in the heavens, and we can pinpoint when Jesus was born. This was his birth sky, okay? Which means you can actually extrapolate meaning from his birth sky the way secular astrologers would extra extrapolate meaning from your or my birth sky and give us a horoscope, right? Mm -hmm. So you can see the connection. Now, I'm not advocating that. I'm not advocating horoscopes, right? But, right. but now you can see where the... Um, where the genuine comes from so that you can understand why there is a counterfeit, why it even exists. Right. Well, let me say this. I mean, the way you're describing all of this, this sounds more like astronomy to me than astrology. Am I wrong? I mean, well, it's now well, one of the things we need to recognize is that to the ancients, they were the same. Or, they were the same. Yes. They, we, we carved that up, uh, not the same way they did. See, and there's actually three words. There's actually three words that are important here. There's the there's astronomy, astrology, and astromancy. Okay. And if you break all three of them down in the Greek, right, the primary word is the Greek word astron, right? Mm -hmm. And then so astronomy is astron plus nomos. Astrology mm -hmm. is astron plus logos. And yes. then astromancy is astron plus mancia, right? So nomos means the means law, logos means story, and then mancia means divination. Okay, so if you think about necromancy, okay, which is divination and contact with dead bodies and calling up the dead and things like that, that's divination. That's divination by means of the dead. Okay. Mm -hmm. So astromancy is actually the correct word for divination by mean of the by means of the stars, right? Okay, that should be the word instead of astrology, right? Which as, bingo, bingo. See, you yeah. picked up on it right away. Yeah. But that's a word that we don't use anymore. Okay, so we have substituted the word astrology when astrology simply means the story of the stars. Mm -hmm. OK, so if the stars are telling a story, which they are, by the way, then what's the problem? <laughs> what? OK, meaning, well, what? people, lots of people are going to are going to I'm going to get all kinds of comments on, on the video and on my website saying, well, you're promoting astrology. Well, no. in a way, I mean, yet yeah, both yes and no. What? I am on one hand, I am because I am promoting the story that is in the stars. OK, according to the Bible. According to the Bible, there is a story in the stars. What I'm not promoting is astromancy. We have a problem with the words having been switched out. See, right? I, I think I think you're making a very logical and understandable, yeah, differentiation between the two. And so, if somebody doesn't get that, they just need to watch this again <laughs> and maybe slower. Agreed, agreed. <laughs> but my point being is that the ancients 
they blurred the lines yes between astronomy astrology and astromancy right which is why you do have prohibitions in the old testament about divination from the stars okay but i'm not trying to divine the stars i'm just reading what they say they they tell a story and that's psalm 19 by the way psalm 19 boldly declares that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day they utter speech and night by night they show knowledge and there is no language where their voice is not heard. Right. Well, if that's not the stars telling a story, I don't know what is. It's a universal language. It's a universal language, right? Which ironically connects directly to uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 20, which says there's no one on the earth who can't, who can't be held accountable because his story can be read in the stars. So no one is without is, is with, without excuse, right? So, mm -hmm. but this, okay, this, so we're, you know, we're up to about 50 minutes of the show here. So we got to start actually wrapping up. Yep. But this is the sign that would have been visible in Jesus's birth sky right? Yes. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon underneath her feet and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. So let me point out one last feature that is kind of important here because the constellation Leo here has nine naked eye observable stars. Mm -hmm. But on this date, the planet Jupiter was right here. The planet Venus is right here. And the planet Mercury is right here, yes. which would have made which would have made made twelve naked eye observable uh, stars, which would make it the crown of twelve stars. Voila, viola. Yep, exactly. Voila. So that is how I have reached the conclusion that I believe that this absolutely is the sign of his birth. You've got other people who have worked the same information that I have, and they say no, it's a general sign. It's generic. It's not specific. And I'm like, no, I, I disagree. I respectfully disagree. I think this is very specific and that you can't find. And the thing is, because of the stars, or pardon me, because of the planets that are in Jupiter, okay, that makes this very specific. The crown of 12 stars. Some people say that the crown of 12 stars is a reference to the ecliptic. And I thought that for years, but that, in my opinion, that doesn't make sense because if if Virgo is one of the 12, then the reference should be a crown of 11 stars mm -hmm. because she's one of them. She's one of the stars. Okay. Yeah. She's not on her own head. Okay. The crown right. of 12 stars has to be a crown of 11 stars, not a crown of 12 stars. So I'm splitting hairs, but that's part of my, you know, my research and why I believe this results in being, uh, this is the woman clothed at the sun, the moon underneath her feet, um, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. And because we know the shepherds were watching their flocks by night, we know that Jesus was born during the evening observation. Okay. So even though you have to put the entire thing together in your head from the morning and the evening observation, because we know the shepherds were watching their flocks by night, I believe he was actually born during the time that the woman clothed at the sun and the moon underneath her feet was actually visible on the evening, you know, the, the, you know, right after sunset, you know, on Tishri one in three BC. Let me, let me ask you one final question. It revolves around a different verse that I saw come up within this conversation today. And right. I just want to hear your thoughts on it in relation to Rosh Hashanah and all of this, which is numbers 20, 29, one. Mm -hmm. It says now on the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall also have a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work. It will be to you a day for blowing trumpets. Yes, that's it. That is that is a an explicit reference to the Feast of Trumpets. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, we know that there were seven feasts that the Hebrews had to keep every year. This was one of them. And this will make the perfect way for us to summarize this. You set me up, Michael. You did it beautifully. Which I'm is doing that, my best. Brother. Yep, do my best, right? Because what this means is, and it's almost, it's difficult to say this without tearing up. Because what this means is that as Jesus was being born as Mary was in labor and delivering Jesus of Nazareth 
in, a, in an ordinary Judean home in Bethlehem, surrounded by loving family and midwives, not in a stable. They were not refugees. They were not outcasts. They were not in a stable. They were in a Judean home surrounded by family and midwives. Jesus was being born and six miles away in the temple in Jerusalem, the two witnesses had reported the sighting of the new moon. They had reported it to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin had said, it is so. And the priests were blowing shofars in solemn commemoration of the birth of the Mashiach Nagid, the King of Israel, the Messiah of Israel, and the King of the world. I mean, kaboom. Yeah, it's just, and there it is. And if you know how to unpack it, it's right there in front of us. I'm spe I, I I don't I don't know what to say. It's it's amazing. Yeah. No, well, you know what we can say is God save the king. <laughs> God, God <laughs> I mean, I mean, th I mean, that's it. That's what this is all about. Is that you know we are believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and although we focus on a lot of the history and the science behind demonstrating when Jesus was born, you know, this is this is the Messiah. This is the line of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb of God that died for the sins of the world. And today's his birthday. For a we should days. step out. So we should step outside tonight for a moment. Yeah, you should. You really should. Now the irony is, is you won't actually see this outside tonight. Right. This year it doesn't line up. Okay, but that's how we know that this is the day that he was actually born in the year he was born. Right. Okay, is because. Like I keep saying, you plug it into a computer, an astronomy program, and plug in all the different parameters, and bang, this is a rare, unique sign that would have occurred at that time, and it doesn't occur any other time. So it's not a, it's not random. Not so, and that's how we can pinpoint it as the day that he was born. So, Tim, it's always a pleasure speaking with you, and I always walk away with this with new inspiration and new ideas and knowledge. And it, it makes me feel better in a week that I've been very stressed. Yep. Well, amen, brother. I mean, it is, it is, uh, this is encouraging stuff. And I hope that the people that are listening online, people who are watching live right now, and are going to watch the replay, you know, on YouTube and on my website, I hope you're blessed. And once again, you know, you can listen to this uh, on Friday nights at 10 PM on TR. TBN, uh, or pardon me, TBTRN, the Truth Be Told Radio Network, uh, truthbetoldnetwork.org. And there, you know, you can listen on your Google device, your uh, your Alexa, you can listen on your smartphone, you can log in online, lots of different ways to listen to TBTRN. But yep, God Save the King, Friday nights at 10 p.m. on the Truth Be Told Radio Network. Fantastic. Bye, everybody. <laughs>